Stefan is an astrophysicist with the Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology at Stanford University, and also the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory. He's joining us because his research team recently proved that cosmic rays are born in the aftermath of supernovae. Even though evidence has suggested a link between cosmic rays and supernova remnants, no one has been able to confirm it. That is, until now. Stefan is here to answer your questions about supernova remnants and cosmic rays. So please send your questions to us now by email or Twitter. We'll do our best to answer them over the next 30 minutes. To begin, Stefan, can you explain in lay terms what you found and why it matters, and also, how does your discovery fit into the context of cosmic ray studies that have come before? Yes, thank you, Bruce. So, um, what we found is that cosmic rays are accelerated in giant aftermath of explosions of stars within our galaxy. Um, the reason why cosmic rays are interesting is that um, we know we have known now for about a hundred years that there's a constant flux of very high energy particles hitting the upper atmosphere and even though we've detected them about a hundred years ago we up to now didn't know where exactly they originate and in particular where they got these enormous energies that we that we see in them they move at the speed of or at nearly the speed of light um, and at times can have energies much higher than anything we can produce in terrestrial accelerators now we use gamma rays the highest energy form of light so if you think of x-rays being higher in energy than the visual light that you can see with your eye then gamma rays are even higher in energy. We use these to pinpoint the location in which cosmic rays are accelerated to two particular remnants of supernova explosions in our galaxy. Now it should be stressed that scientists have for a long time believed um, that cosmic rays originate in supernova explosion. Uh, in some sense this is a continuation of a lot of earlier work that um, was done both theoretically and observationally uh, that and, and there were lots of strong hints uh, pointing to these supernova remnants as we call them as the accelerator of cosmic rays um, but this is the first I would say incontroversial evidence uh, direct evidence that protons indeed Cosmic rays, indeed, are accelerated in supernova explosions. So we have uh, cosmic rays are constantly bombarding the upper atmosphere of the Earth. But as we observe them, and, and they were first discovered about 100 years ago, I understand, they seem to be coming from all directions in space. And uh, just to summarize, what you were able to do is you were looking at one of the decay products of cosmic rays. You weren't actually seeing cosmic rays, but you were looking at a a product of a collision between a cosmic ray and a, a lower energy particle in the supernova remnant which decayed into a gamma ray which then shot st a straight line toward Earth. Is yes, yes this is correct. So, so um, the reason why even now hundred years after the discovery of cosmic rays um, the, 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 the sources or the origin of cosmic rays has still been a puzzle is not because people have not tried to study them in detail. We have studied them in, in great detail as they arrive here uh, in the upper atmosphere with both balloon experiments, satellite experiments, and ground-based experiments. The reason why it's so hard to study where they come from is, um, the, is that they are mostly charged particles. So the, they are about 90% protons. Um, there's a smaller percentage of uh, heavier nuclei like helium, etc., and then there's an even smaller percentage of electrons. But all of these cosmic rays, um, as they arrive here on Earth, they are charged particles. The problem with the charged particles is 
They don't travel in straight lines in our galaxy. In fact, they are deflected by magnetic fields that permeate our galaxy. Within our galaxy, there are magnetic fields everywhere. And basically what happens if you put a charged particle into a magnetic field is the path of the particle is bent. Um, and this happens a lot of times before the cosmic ray that is accelerated somewhere, it must be accelerated somewhere because we know that they arrive here, um, the, 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 the deflection in the magnetic field happens many times and therefore as the cosmic rays arrive here on Earth, they arrive, as we call it, completely isotropically. That means with the same flux from all directions. So if you had cosmic ray eyes instead of optical eyes, and uh, then the night sky would look very boring because it would just be the same amount of cosmic rays coming from all directions, as opposed to the night sky as we see it, where there are bright stars in one direction and darker spots in another direction. So what we used, so we, so basically we cannot use these cosmic rays, the, the, these protons, to do astrophysics. We cannot use their arrival direction to find out where they come from. And therefore, we had to turn so, to something that is not affected by the magnetic field, to something that is electrically neutral. And this is why we used the highest energy form of light. Light is electrically neutral and therefore travels in straight lines from wherever the light is generated to us. Now, the cosmic ray protons, they are accelerated somewhere, and what they can do is they can um, interact with um, low energy particles like hydrogen, atoms, etc., and produce these uh, subatomic particles called pions. Um, and this is a well-known process that we have studied in particle accelerators in the 1950s and 60s. And what happens if a neutral pion gets produced, a neutral pion is basically a subatomic particle similar to a proton in that it consists of quarks, but this subatomic particle de decays in a tiny fraction of a second into two gamma rays. And these travel in straight lines from wherever they are produced to us, and these is uh, are what we used to pinpoint the location of the acceleration of the protons into the supernova remnants. So um, I was going to say that we had a, a great question from an eighth grader from Northern Virginia who asked about this process um, and I thought that was a great setup to, to your explanation. So um, she had asked, um, you know, is it known exactly how cosmic rays are generated from supernova? And, and what you just explained, as I understand it, is that the cosmic rays are not generated right at the time of the supernova or the exploding star, but they, the um, cosmic rays are generated over time uh, as the shock wave from the supernova uh, expands out into space and accelerates these subatomic, these protons, to near light speeds, at which time they become cosmic rays. And then what you, what you said was these cosmic rays, these very high energy protons, collide with lower energy protons in the gases um, of the expanding star and in, in, in space that the shock wave encounters. Um, after that collision, this subatomic particle that you called a, a pion um, is generated, and then that is highly unstable, quickly decays into a gamma ray, and then that shoots a straight line toward Earth. And so that's, when you look at these supernova remnants, these, these aftermath regions of, of star explosions, um, you can find, uh, if, you, if you look for that gamma ray and you find it, that's evidence for this kind of chain of events that, that starts with the uh, production of a cosmic ray. Now, what is it about that gamma ray the, is it the energy level of that gamma ray that's very particular to this process? Ah, yeah. So, first of all, the, your explanation of the, your description of the process is exactly right. So, um, the, the, it's not the supernova explosion itself that accelerates the cosmic rays. It's the shock wave that gets generated as the material of the star uh, is thrown out into the interstellar medium. 
And in this shock wave, the particles are accelerated, and I can talk more later about how these particles exactly are accelerated in a shock wave. Um, but then it's exactly right. They, they hit uh, gas partic uh, particles that are surrounding this region, produce these pions, and these pions produce gamma rays. Now, the tricky part um, about our study was that there are also other processes that can produce gamma rays. In particular, accelerated electrons can produce gamma rays. And so the gamma ray, as it enters our detector, doesn't really tell us whether it was produced by an accelerated proton or by an accelerated electron. However, this decay of the neutral pion has one very, very characteristic signature. Um, and that is that below a certain energy, we don't see any gamma rays. And that has to do with the fact that this neutral pion is a massive particle and therefore has a rest mass. And because of energy conservation, these gamma rays get a minimum, mi minimal energy because you basically have to distribute the mass of the pion into these two gamma rays. Basically, because of E equals mc squared, there has to be energy conservation. And therefore, this is, this is the signature we were looking for. We were looking for a characteristic um, drop in gamma ray emission below a certain energy. And that's exactly what we see from these two objects. They are very, very bright at higher energies. And then below a certain energy, they, they completely drop. And we don't see them anymore. So you can measure the energy of the gamma rays coming from the supernova remnants. And um, that particular signature tells you that it, its origin is with a cosmic ray that has collided with a lower energy particle. That's exactly right. I mean, basically what we measure are four quantities for each gamma ray. It's the direction on the sky. I mean, so, that, so that's two quantities. Then it's the energy, and then it's the arrival time. For this study, the arrival time is, is, is not very important because the flux from this object uh, is very steady, from these objects is very steady. Uh, but we can use the energy and the direction on the sky to learn about the processes that led to the generation of these gamma rays. So let's back up a little bit um, and go back to a question from the public, uh, very basically regarding cosmic rays. Um, describe uh, in, in simple layperson terms what cosmic rays are. Um, so we, we've discovered that they're generated in, or you've discovered, excuse me, not me, but you've discovered that they're generated uh, in the aftermath of supernova, but they, they come from other sources, is that right? So let's start by saying, um, you know, by talking, what, what is a cosmic ray? It's not really a ray at all, is it? Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, the, the, the term cosmic ray is actually a misnomer. Cosmic rays are not rays at all. They are particles. Uh, and as I described earlier, they are mostly protons. There's a smaller fraction of higher nuclei, and then there's a, an even smaller fraction of electrons. Um, they are exciting because I would say for two reasons. The one reason is these cosmic rays um, Within these cosmic rays, we observe the highest energy particles ever observed by humans. So in any of our terrestrial accelerators, uh, the energies we produce are way smaller. I mean, even at the Large Hadron Collider uh, in, in, at CERN in Geneva, the energies are way smaller than, en than some of the energies we see in these cosmic rays. And that's because uh, they're moving so fast, near the speed of light. Exactly. Uh, the second reason why they are in interesting to me, so, th so this is the, f the first reason is somehow how do these, these are the most energetic particles in our universe, and, and I want to find out how do they get these enormous energies. The second reason why I find them very interesting is that they are the only source of uh, material from outside our solar system that we have. So. There's a lot we can study about the universe by measuring um, these particles, by measuring their energies, by measuring um, exactly what fraction of them are protons, electrons, and higher nuclei, etc. And then, of course, they also affect us. Um, they are a source of radiation. So um, this, this is one of the reasons why 
long distance uh, flights, uh, intercontinental flights, uh, give you a higher radiation damage because you go basically higher in the atmosphere uh, and therefore you are less shielded from these cosmic rays. So it's not just energy from the sun, radiation from the sun that can hurt us at high altitudes, it's also these uh, cosmic rays from all over the galaxy that are coming toward Earth. Absolutely, and uh, I mean this, the, the, the cosmic rays are a severe problem for long duration space flight for that matter because uh, if we for example want to travel to Mars we are no more shielded by the atmosphere and therefore um, you get a, a substantially increased radiation damage on these long duration flights. Uh, there are additional suggestions that cosmic rays might have been responsible for the creation of life because they, they might have uh, provided mutations that then um, could have been uh, um, basically uh, formed early, early forms of life. Uh, there are also suggestions that they have something to do with the creation of clouds. Um, and they certainly affect uh, computers on satellites. Um, so in that sense, I would say they're very interesting and they also affect us. In fact, as we are sitting here, um, the, the, so the cosmic rays, when they interact with the atmosphere, they, create, they, they basically decay and, and create what is called a particle shower. Uh, and these secondary particles, they go through your body all the time. So as we speak, there's about uh, 200 of these secondary shower particles that go through your head every minute. Are they harmful? <laughs> well, the, the nice thing is that we have the atmosphere, so we know that the, the flux of cosmic rays is stable over centuries and, and very long times, so we are experiencing the same radiation from uh, cosmic rays um, as people have been in earlier times, and I think, uh, so, so in that sense, I think we are pretty safe, but of course, as we, as we leave the atmosphere, uh, the story is very different. So I have another question from the public, um, and it's an interesting one. Have we de you, you described a couple of different kinds of cosmic rays, but have we discovered any new ones recently? Maybe a new species of cosmic ray that we haven't detected before? Uh, not really. I mean, the, the, so if you look at the elemental composition of the cosmic rays, it pretty much resembles the interstellar medium. So... Um, it's, it has the same amount of, uh, of the different sp species like hydrogen, helium, etc. By interstellar find... medium you mean the space between stars. That's correct, exactly. So, so in that sense there are no new uh, things in the cosmic rays. On the other hand, of course, if you go back in history, um, cosmic rays uh, were absolutely responsible for the birth of particle physics as we know it because back in the early days of particle physics, maybe in the 1920s, 1930s, people didn't have accelerators like the Large Hadron Collider. People were using these particles from outer space to study new uh, subatomic particles. And in fact, a lot of the subatomic particle discoveries uh, were made using cosmic rays. Um, the other thing that might be new recently, uh, I mean relatively recently, is we have um, we, we have continued to measure the energy spectrum of the cosmic rays um, and in particular we have extended our reach to extremely high energies. There's an installation in uh, Argentina called the Pierre Auger Telescope that measures um, uh, the so-called ultra high energy cosmic rays which are in fact not part of this study. Um, for these ultra high energy particles, the flux is extremely low. You detect about one particle per century per square kilometer. That's about the flux you have. So it's, it's very low. You need huge detection areas to be able to detect such particles. Uh, and in fact, we have detected particles in recent years that have uh, the kinetic energy of a, uh, of a tennis serve by the best players in the world. Uh, but not in a tennis ball, but in a tiny subatomic particles. So, so, so you have a range of different kinds of cosmic rays, like you described. Yeah. Uh, but they are, there's also a range of different energies at which they come into the Earth, and, and so the Absolutely. study of the different different kinds of energies. They're all very high energy, but there there is a range. 
Um, that's a, an active field of study as well. Absolutely. So um, uh, I have an interesting question here from the public. It says, um, how can cosmic rays be used to understand the greater universe? In other words, can, can cosmic rays somehow be used to, um, uh, let's see, to explain dark matter or dark energy? Uh, okay, so the, they, they can't be used really to explain dark energy. There is a way of using cosmic rays, uh, at least some of the cosmic rays, to study dark matter. Um, there are well, I should say, uh, as, an, as an aside, so yep. uh, uh, dark matter is um, actually um, comprises most of the physical matter in the, in the universe and, yep. and makes up about, about a quarter of everything that's in the universe, and we have no idea what it is. Mm -hmm. That's correct. So, mm -hmm. so, and then dark energy, just to finish this off, is mm -hmm. the stuff that affects the evolution of the universe at large, that, that, that provides uh, some pressure to make the universe expand uh, over, over long periods of time. But for dark matter, there are uh, quite a number, so we don't know what dark matter is. We think that dark matter is a particle, an, an elementary particle, uh, but we haven't detected um, dark matter in our particle accelerator, nor have we detected it through other means. But there are, so there, there are lots of theories what dark matter could actually be, um, but a lot of them um, suggest that dark matter can annihilate so two dark matter particles can interact with each other and can produce uh, particles that we also find in the cosmic rays. In particular, it, uh, they can produce positrons uh, and antiprotons in these uh, annihilation of two dark matter particles. And so measuring the flux of positrons or measuring the flux of antiprotons as they arrive here, we can hope to ha get a handle, a better handle on the properties of dark matter, and this is a field of active study. So there could be a, a strong link between cosmic rays or understanding the properties of cosmic rays that could teach us something about dark matter in the longer term. Yes, that's absolutely right. Um, but it should be said that we think that the majority of cosmic rays are produced in the more, if you want, traditional ways, um, either by these shock waves of exploding stars like we found here, uh, these the shock waves of supernova remnants, or for the higher energy cosmic rays, for these ultra high energy cosmic rays that I talked about before, we think that they might be generated in jets of uh, black holes and things like that. So, so the, 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 I would say the majority of the cosmic rays probably are not directly linked to, uh, to dark matter. Let me ask you a little bit about um, your study. Um, how long did it take you to gather, and this is again from the uh, question from the public, how, how long did it take you to gather all the data that you needed for this research? Ah, okay, so, so the instrument we used is the Fermi Large Area Telescope on board the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, which is quite a nice coincidence because um, Enrico Fermi was an Italian physicist who uh, migrated to the U.S. And he was, in fact, the first one who suggested uh, a mechanism how shock waves of, of, of dying stars, these supernova remnants, can accelerate particles uh, that we see in the cosmic rays. So he, he basically told us the mechanism um, how these cosmic rays can be accelerated that was now, uh, in some sense, confirmed with this instrument. So um, it was his theory that began it all. Yeah, it was his, well, I mean, the discovery of cosmic rays was earlier, of course, um, but his theory was the first uh, link that we had between the supernova remnants um, and the cosmic rays. Um, so we use this telescope, and this telescope is orbiting the Earth. Uh, it was launched by now about four and a half years ago. We used four years of data. Um, and um, the, the nice thing about this Fermi uh, Large Area Space Telescope is it has a very large field of view. So that means that basically this, this telescope sees 
the whole sky sees 20% of the sky at any given moment and it sees the whole sky every two orbits, which is every three hours. So basically we didn't have to stare or point our telescope at the particular location of these supernova remnants, uh, but this telescope is continuously accumulating data and um, we basically just were able to, look, to take this data set that was accumulated during these four years um, and then analyze the data to try to find this characteristic signature that I uh, explained earlier. So was it um, somewhat of a race to find this, to confirm this theory? Um, you know, what did you do differently that um, other groups might not have done? And again, that's an interesting question from the public. Um, I wouldn't say it was per se a race. Um, so the, so first of all, um, earlier instruments basically didn't have the sensitivity to detect this feature from supernova remnants. So in some sense, it's technical innovation um, that led to this instrument, and it was always, it had always been clear that um, this is one of the prime goals of this instrument, of the Fermi Large Area Telescope, to try to search for this signature. Um, the study itself is somewhat complex because the characteristic feature that we're looking for is at very low gamma ray energies. And at very low gamma ray energies, uh, the, the gamma rays don't leave a lot of information in our detector. So we had to study very hard to be able to extract the relevant information from the data and to be able to do so. Um, I definitely have to say that this was very much a team effort. So um, it's the whole, the whole collaboration, which consists of about 400 scientists uh, all over the world, was involved in um, understanding the instrument to a sufficient level um, and helping to, to be able to really extract the information at those low energies uh, before we could actually do that. So this was a real international collaboration to arrive Absolutely. at this result. Absolutely. I mean, I would never have been able to do this myself. It's, it's, it's really a, a combination of a lot of people that were involved um, and, that, and that led to this discovery. Great. Uh, well, it, it looks like we have time for a couple of more questions, but some interesting ones. Uh, one of them is, um, again, from the public. It says, um, let's see here. Can we learn more about supernovae, uh, these uh, death knells of stars, by mm -hmm. studying the cosmic rays that you're studying? Did you, can we learn more about the differences in supernovae and, and how one is different from the other and just about the character of the explosion itself and the remnant that comes after? Yeah, this is a very good question. Um, I would say that it's probably uh, not possible. I think we, we, we learn more about the um, supernova uh, not from studying the cosmic rays, but from studying the particles that tra that travel uh, directly through the magnetic fields, i.e., by studying light or radio um, uh, uh, radio waves, X-rays, and for that matter, also gamma rays. But as I told you before, the cosmic rays, as they arrive here, they have been so much deflected from their original path that from the cosmic rays as we see them here, it's very hard to connect them to individual objects on the sky. Um, and therefore, I don't think we can use the cosmic rays to study uh, the supernova explosion. One thing that I, I think is very exciting and very interesting is um, we can use x-rays um, from the supernova remnants um, to study the explosion itself. And this has been done uh, quite recently through uh, things like light echoes where you basically still now can see the light of the original ex uh, supernova explosion, things like that. But I don't think per se we can use the cosmic rays. I mean, the, the one thing that is interesting about the cosmic rays that we might eventually be doing is we can learn a little bit about the explosion energies uh, of, uh, the, of, of, of supernova explosion. Uh, but I think, I would say this is probably not 
the, the top priority for us, and it's going to be very hard to connect that to individual remnants. Something you just said about um, studying the light from a supernova explosion uh, reminded me of a question from our eighth grader in Northern Virginia. Uh, she asks, um, it says, uh, uh, what causes the different colors and patterns in supernova explosions? Okay, so um, different, I mean, if you look at the typical images that NASA releases uh, about supernova explosion, they are very often um, color-coded to highlight the different uh, wave bands that have been used to discover the supernova remnants. So very often, say, blue uh, shows you what the radio emission would look like, and yellow shows you what the optical emission would look like, and green what the X-ray emission would look like. Um, but these are not the colors per se of the remnant as you would see it uh, if, if your eye uh, was able to resolve all these details. Uh, I think very often NASA basically color codes uh, these different wave bands to make them to make them look nicer for us. Okay, um, and uh, uh, closing question from our from uh, uh, our eighth grader. Um, you've obviously had a tremendous amount of training in, uh, to understand your own work, and um, she was asking um, that uh, I was thinking of becoming an astrophysicist and. What kind of education does an astrophysicist need to have? And I think that's a great a great place to wrap up. Oh yeah, that's an absolutely great question. So um, I would say the the most important um, thing in that regard is you have to have a curiosity for nature. And obviously, given your questions, you have that. Um, beyond that, there's of course you have to learn the tools you need. To be able to do this kind of research, and uh, there are of course great programs both in physics or in astrophysics that would prepare you to do this kind of research. The other thing that I would encourage you to do is, um, I mean, ask people at the astronomy or at the physics department in a close by university. Very often they have ex extremely good programs for doing summer internship, uh, summer research, things like that. So you can really see uh, whether that kind of work uh, is appealing to you. I can definitely say this is the best kind of work I, I could imagine to do. Uh, but yeah, you should try it out, absolutely. Great. Uh, Stefan, thank you so much for your time. And um, it was a pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you, Bruce. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.